can be seated. It's always a great privilege to have Brother Coleman with us. Always brings excellent, thoughtful messages from God's Word. That's the key to everything, the Word of God. And he's deeply involved in missions as the director of the Independent Board for Presbyterian Foreign Missions. He's on the cutting edge of reaching out through missionaries all around the world, some of whom are with us today, for whom we are very thankful. Brother Coleman, come and preach the word. Acts chapter 1, if you would open your Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 1. While you're doing that, I need to clarify what Mr. McCoy referred to as my fashion faux pas. This piece of four-ply tire that's been Velcroed to my foot was a result of being a grandfather carrying his grandson down the stairs a very early morning to get a bottle, and I reached the last step and my foot just slipped over. Well, as one of those almost uh, heroic touchdown catches, I'm mindful of making sure the grandson doesn't hit the ground, and as I'm going down, my foot goes eek. Um, went to the uh, urgent care, the x-rayed it, and says, just some ligament damage, uh, nothing fractured. Uh, the ligament damage healed up, but I kept on feeling some pain. And further x-rays found a number of fractures, so I am hopefully be rid of this before the snow flies. Not looking forward to that. Good to be with you this morning and privileged to be able to share. Um, as we continue on with this missions weekend and uh, thankful for pastor's introduction to our table over there and also take some time to speak with uh, Caleb and, and his wife Deborah on their way out. Acts 1 8, very familiar passage as we consider the Great Commission. Uh, we read here, but ye, shall, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. He shall be witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Jesus commissioned his disciples, and I want you to note where the areas that he makes mention of here in this initial uh, mentioning of this commission. Uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. Now flip over a couple of pages to Acts 8.1. Just reversing, you know, Acts 1 8, go to 8 1, and begin to see how, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we see these places mentioned, we would say, in the fulfillment of this, or at least the start of the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Acts 8 1, and Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And then look down to verse 4. Therefore they were scattered abroad when they therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. He gives the Great Commission, and yet in its fulfillment, even in this early stages of this infant church, we see that the scattered went to Judea, Samaria, from Jerusalem, and to every part of the world. As you've heard no doubt many, many times, this Great Commission has been passed on to us. It's in our generation. It's our responsibility to continue to take to our Jerusalem and our Judea and Samaria and our uttermost parts of the world as God gives us occasion. Yet for me here this morning to suggest that this task of fulfilling the Great Commission is an easy one would be absurd. It has never been easy. The challenges of going into a foreign nation and learning a language and understanding a culture. We picked up some of that from the, the Kongs as they talked about coming from uh, Korea and Singapore to, to Kenya and now into Guatemala. Uh, understanding the persecution or the hatred that there are those who have against Christ and his truth and for his people. It's a Goliath type of opposition that exists. But if I could offer a suggestion this morning that the greatest hindrance to the fulfilling of 
the Great Commission in our day, and I think for the most part in any day, is not necessarily the hindrances that we mention, but it's the excuses that we give. The excuses that we give. Excuses, for the most part, I believe, that we mostly make in ourselves that prevent us from sharing Christ with others. You see, you know that it's not the right time. You know, I, I'm, I am pretty busy. I've got a lot of things on my plate right now. I'm a little bit afraid of, of talking to somebody about the gospel. I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant because of what might they say. I could be embarrassed. or you know, There are all types of excuses that we convince ourselves of that limit us, that keep us, that prevent us from being what we're supposed to be. We are supposed to be witnesses of this glorious gospel. Yet if we were honest with ourselves, we would freely admit that none of these excuses have ever stopped us from a worldly pursuit. Get a job, an education, a better education, a better job, seek to improve my life, get a car, a house, uh, uh, you know, make sure I got season tickets, uh, anything. None of those excuses ever stopped us from the pursuit of the things that are we would say more easily obtainable here in this world but when it comes to the pursuit of winning others for Christ it would seem that for so many we are able to excuse ourselves from seriously considering that responsibility we were at Bob Jones uh, I think it's like two weeks ago spent some days with the young people it was their global outreach week and had a good time talking with them I had uh, 30 minutes in speaking at a theology class, not for the Bible students, but for those that are there of some other vocation. Uh, those who are in the, uh, the, the culinary arts department, or those who are there for uh, the, the drama or, or something else. And I talked with them, and the professor said that, you know, something he's trying to emphasize, that those who are of other areas, not just in ministry, that we say, that they need to have an understanding of what God's Word says, practically speaking, because they need it in their life. That they would be representatives of sharing the gospel in what other non, what we would refer to as non-Christian application. But you know, I opened my New Testament as I continue to read it. I think surprisingly so, we would find that there's a lot of evangelistic activity found in the New Testament that were in situations that weren't necessarily very accommodating. We say, well, I can't witness to somebody, or I can't share the gospel, because the situation just isn't right. We kind of think of the best, the most ideal, somebody to come to me and say, would you tell me about Jesus Christ? That's about the best case scenario. A good example is in John chapter 4, and we find Jesus witnessing to the Samaritan woman at the well. We saw Jesus and the disciples traveling from Judea to Samaria, a distance of about 60 miles. And it was no easy journey, on foot. Uh, take a little while to make that walk. Um, and it was noonday, as the passage tells us. Hottest time of the day. They've been walking. Um, makes reference to Jesus sending the disciples out to get some food. So. They were hungry. Jesus is at the well and talks to the woman about the water. And so no doubt there was a matter of, of being thirsty, tired, walking all that distance. Um, and legs are sore. Feet are tired. Let me read from John 4, beginning at verse 5. It says, Then cometh he unto the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore being wearied, obviously, hot, tired, long trip, walking all those miles, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour, noontime, there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. 
if there was ever an occasion where somebody could have excused themselves from being witnessing, this was it. I am tired. It's been difficult. Weary of the journey. It's hot. I'm sweating. My feet are burning. You know, my legs are sore. The muscles. Anyway, and I just want to sit and relax. I'm hungry. If there was ever an occasion where Jesus could have used an excuse, which obviously he never did, to avoid the Father's will, this could have been one. Maybe it would have been one that I said I would have excused the situation. But in Providence, it worked out that this was the woman who came at the right time, and Jesus opened unto her the glorious gospel. Another instance, and you're there in, um, in Acts Acts 8.1, and Saul was consenting unto his death, meaning Stephen. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. And as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that had were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. The account, as you mentioned, makes mention here of, of the death of Stephen, the stoning of Stephen. Um, previous chapter, you look, and he was charged with blasphemy, brought to the uh, the trial before the Sanhedrin and, and trumped up charges and yet Stephen stands before them and presents a glorious testimony of his faith. The Lord Jesus Christ uh, speaks very powerfully to them and out of that they take him out and they stone him to death. You know, as a leader of this brand new fledgling New Testament church, I think it was a tremendous loss. If I'm the fly on the wall and the various gatherings around and they hear the death of Stephen, it had to be somewhat discouraging for them. I think it showed how vulnerable the church was and how weak they were in a world that not only hated Christ, but this hatred for Christ was now continuing on in their hatred for the followers of Christ, these Christians. They were regarded as outcasts and outlaws and criminals, and they were to be hunted down. We saw what Saul did, hunted down and thrown into prison. Again, beginning at verse 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church. The people went into every house, men and women committed to prison. Verse 4, therefore they were scattered abroad, went everywhere preaching the word. But when the church was in its most helpless, weakest state, they all of a sudden realized the great power of what God was doing through them. They were the strongest and most glorious. Persecution made the church grow faster and extended that witness even further than before. Acts chapter 11, beginning at 19. Now they were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Notice in these two sections from Acts 2 and Acts 11 that the ones who were preaching the gospel were not full-time pastors, missionaries, evangelists. They didn't have a rapid course in Jerusalem and Come here and pay your fee and we'll stamp out some doctorates for you and you can take them out. They were regular people whose hearts were changed by the power of the gospel, the preaching of Peter and others. 
And their hearts were strangely warmed as they were brought into the family of God. But then as persecution arose, they were scattered back, and I think many of them back to their hometowns. And if you look in action, you, you pull out a New Testament map, it's a thousand mile radius from Jerusalem that they came to there for a purpose, but then all of a sudden because of persecution scattered abroad. And what was their response? What did they do? Did they cower in fear? Did they say, this is a losing cause? I'm not going to get thrown in prison. It says they went everywhere preaching the gospel. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem. We saw that particular verse there. Consider the time in which these people lived. Consider the power of the Roman Empire, the worship of, of uh, the emperor himself, and all the other gods that become incorporated locally. Consider the persecution of, that was evident in these areas. Consider how they were uprooted, relocating families and homes to new and unfamiliar places. Consider these very people that they still bothered to witness to their neighbors and to new friends. Talking with those students the other week, I says, how do you think the gospel, all of a sudden, within that first century, multiplied so tremendously when there was no seminary and no bus ministry, no radio and no TV and no internet ministries. It came out of the hearts of the people who were there in Jerusalem, who were saved and whom God scattered abroad. And they says, this is something that's so exciting to me, life-changing, that I've got to share it. It has to be part of my very life. I think the zeal of the first century church puts us to shame. I think the excitement that they found, the life-changing events that occurred with them, them naturally transferred into life, into family, into whatever they did. And if persecution comes, then it comes that we'll go to another place and take this message that we've been so privileged to hear and believe. We enjoy the comforts of life without real persecution. We don't really suffer as so many do, and yet we are still well-versed in the excuses why we have not taken up the gospel ministry of sharing Christ. These people were not professionals. They were not full-time workers. They were not pastors and evangelists and missionaries. They were people just like all of us. God's word clearly tells us that it is the work of testifying of the Lord Jesus Christ to all, just not a selected, trained group. Obviously, some have been given particular gifts and skills to do that, but it's for the furtherance of the gospel as the body is better equipped, as each one receives that which is necessary. I, I remember my early years as a believer, and mission team came in and I was saying boy I want to be a missionary you know and then Shelton College had a, a recruiting team came by you know and pastor says well you're going to have to get some training before you ever want to be a missionary I, I was ready to go right away and he says but you really don't know what you're saying you know and so it went on to the furtherance of the training and and then I thought well there is a difference between full-time and part-time work I'm going into the full-time ministry but then as I thought about it, as time goes on, what about those who are part-time? Right? It doesn't make sense. I can be a part-time Christian. I can be a part-time witnesser. I, may, I can be part-time in my obedience to the Great Commission. No. We're all full-time in the ministry of the gospel. Kongs talk about training young Guatemalans not in essence for the ministry, but bringing them up in Christ that they would be better equipped as carpenters or as people who work in the fields or as educators or whatever it is as Christians to continue on that particular work that they've been called to. Now is the accepted time at home, at school, at the workplace, in the market, and the plane, and the bus. Anywhere we go, we have the occasion to do that. 
speaking of home and family, I believe that living godly at home before non-Christian family members can be a tremendous challenge. Some of the dearest ones in my own family that I love the most were the hardest to witness to. Personally, talking with them, I struggle with that. And I think all of us have those same feelings. Yet these ones that are the closest to us, we need to find opportunities to share Christ with them in some fashion or another. Bringing God's word into their life. Allowing them to read that which is life-saving. And if not necessarily in the word of God directly, then, you know, books about Christianity. A pastor friend of mine talks very powerfully about giving his father a, a biography in the Apostle Paul. And he says, as my dad, who really didn't care much at all for Christianity, read through this, finally as he reached the end, he says, I want to know more about this God who changed Saul to Paul. And it eventually led to his salvation. You know, Bringing the, the full spectrum of allowing God's word, life-changing moments in the life, living godly. What can that do within the family unit? Millie and I have a Japanese friend came to Christ and as he worked in New York City and the company that he worked for closed up. Uh, he says, you know, Pastor, he says, I think the Lord wants me to be a preacher. And he went back to Japan, go to seminary. Um, he living with his mom and dad who were Buddhist and uh, he's been there for three years now. Recently he wrote me and he said, my mom is stepping back from her Buddhism and she says, he said that she sees some difference in me and although they wouldn't have anything to do with Christianity, she's stepped back from it. And she's viewing other things other than that. She says, she sees a testimony, my love for God and my love for his word and there's something different that she's hungering for. Living godly for Christ can speak volumes to those who are around us. Beyond family, what's our greatest area of influence? Where do we spend the most time usually outside of family? Well, at a job or at school. Six to eight to ten hours a day, five days a week, sometimes six days a week. We're with people that we see all the time. We're with people who we can interact with and, and sometimes know them better than other people in our life's sphere. What a wonderful area of influence we can have on these people to witness to them. People who know us and see us and have certain connections and, and again many closer than our own relatives. I think of Aquila and Priscilla. I don't, you can read in between the lines of what the, uh, the scripture talks about them, but I can see a couple who were in the workplace, in the workforce of, of their Roman world. And you read of the influence that they had, not only with, with Paul and with Apollos, but I can't, can see them having an influence on others that came in with them, because they knew them. Principles of discipleship, you know. What's the difference? Why are you like this? Why do you do your business like this? Why do you... Caleb says, we have our school and we make sure that as the children go through, and he says there's a habit of cheating in the school systems. And he says we make sure that the students go through living honestly, that they do their tests honestly. Why? That's because what Christians do. The Apostle Paul tells the church at Corinth, Ye are our, you, ye are our epistle written in your hearts, known and read of all men. I'm a living epistle. I'm a living letter. As people see me and they respond to the life situations around me, why do you act like that? Why aren't you all, you know? No, I, the gospel, this is what Jesus has done for me. This is a sovereign God who overrules my life. And people read that. And what a powerful influence that can be. I shared this statistic with you sometime before, but if you're like me, as you get older, you forget things. So it's worth repeating, and if you remember, amen. If not, then you'll get it first time. It was a poll done by the American Church Growth 
and it was asking 4,000 people how they were influenced to first attend church and eventually become believers. What was the key, what was the link that, that brought you into church and brought you in the presence of the gospel that you became saved? Starts out with the smallest amount, a half percent to one percent came through public evangelistic crusades and campaigns. One to two percent came out of a special need. One to two percent were reached through visitation programs. Two to three percent just walked in off the street. Two to three percent came through a church program. Four to five percent came through Sunday school class. Five to six percent were attracted by the preacher. <laughs> Sometimes we think we, we boast much more than we ought, you know. But 75 to 90 percent eventually came to Christ through the influence of friends and relatives. That's the New Testament church testimony. How did the church grow? Well, obviously through the power of the preaching of the gospel, but in the lives of the individuals. They influenced. They knew the better than anybody else the people around them. But what about those who are not necessarily friends or family or co-workers or classmates? Have you ever done it cold turkey? Come up to them and try to witness to somebody you have no idea anything about them or they sit down next to you. What do you do? How do we handle those situations? Sometimes I think we avoid that like a plague. Sometimes our fears because of rejection, our fears of what they would say, our fears of, of some confrontation keeps us from doing that. But let me suggest that that should not be the case. Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 26, we read of a man, Philip, meeting an Ethiopian eunuch. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is the desert. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, eunuch of great authority under Candice, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasures and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning, sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to his chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, heard him read from the prophet Isaiah, and said, Where are you going today? beautiful weather we're having. What do you think about the traffic back there in Jerusalem? Is that what he said? Sometimes when we see a door open and an occasion that's right there saying, talk to me about the gospel, our conversation is just about the pleasantries of life. How the eagles do, you know, all oh, the fillies next year, you know, oh yeah, we don't want to come. What does he say? Understandest thou what thou readest? Do you understand what you're reading? God provides an open door and through one simple question he enters into this understanding the key. How can I understand this unless somebody guides me? One question leads to an opening of the man's heart and his mind and Philip says, here I go. Sometimes that's all it takes, cold turkey. Bob Vandermeer, a pastor who led Millie and I to the Lord, said, I always travel with a, a New York Times or a Wall Street Journal under my arm when I get in a plane. And he says, that newspaper, sitting down in the flight and reading it, brought me into so much contact with people, of conversations, of, of the articles that were in there. What do you think about this? And it led me to ask a question. What about this tragedy? Would you have been prepared if you were in this situation? A plane crash, you know. What would you have done? You know. How about this political situation? Or how about this? What do you think about this? And all of a sudden, that, that inanimate object or whatever it is leads to the question and the person feels his defenses go down 
and you're able to ask the questions and then provide them with some insight. Do you ever sit with somebody and their their whole countenance is just, you know, how you feel? Or, how you doing? Yeah. Just not a, you know, casual, how you know, oh, I'm fine. No, how are you doing? What's anything you want to talk about? And, and all of a sudden they go, well, you know, well, we've had this trial or this, you know, I'm bothered by this or whatever. And there's your opportunity for somebody you don't know that they've opened up their soul slightly in order for a witness to be able to share to them. Sometimes we find ourselves practically impossibly doing things, but God provides these questions in order that we might sow some seeds. And you know that's what we do, isn't it? Sow seeds. We don't twist arms. We don't trick. We don't befuddle them. We don't promise them something or this or that in order to disguise what we're there for. We may not necessarily get the answer we expected. The Apostle Paul in Acts 17 is meeting with a group up in Mars Hill in Athens, and to his gospel response they say, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, we'll hear of thee of this matter later on. Mars Hill may have seemed like a, a dead fish, dead as the stones that were there giving testimony to the gods that they were worshiping. But who knows what took place in the lives of those men in a year's time or five years' time? Who knows that they might have been very part of the church? But Paul sowed the seed and he left the, 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 the giving of the increase into the hands of God. Our job is not to win them to Christ. Our job is to sow that seed. And if there's an opportunity to that response, then we bring it together. But that's the the responsibility we have. I'm going to close with an illustration from Hudson Taylor, the founder of the China Inland Mission, the uh, Overseas Missionary Fellowship today. He was asked by one of his first converts, how long have you people in the West known about the good news? And Mr. Taylor, how long have you from England in the West known about this gospel message, salvation? Taylor replied, he says, well, we have had it for many centuries. And on hearing this, the Chinese convert looked painfully at him and said, in effect, do you mean to say that you Christians in the West have had the truth for hundreds of years, but only now you have come to tell us about it? What took you so long? If truth were known to the people in our communities, you know, I'm a Christian. Oh, man, I never knew that. I never had any clue about your walk. You know, I, I never had any clue what the book was, if even for most young people it's that electronic device, you know. <laughs> never had any clue about who you were. Why didn't you tell me before? Why didn't you share that with me? We cannot keep this truth to ourselves. We're to make it known to the non-Christians that we come across every day. Remember, we were once like them. Never to go back. Horrible life to live. We were once like them. They need the truth as much as we did. May the Lord help us to make that truth known to them. Let's pray. Father, we acknowledge the tremendous numbers who are without Christ. Millions upon millions upon millions that are born into this world and have never even heard of Christ, have never had any, known anybody who was any idea about being a Christian, and never had any witness or seen any literature. Others steeped in false religions believing that their particular branch of a world religion assures them slightly of some entrance into heaven that doesn't exist. Even those who are closest to us, 
uncles and aunts, cousins, growing up believing the lies when we have the truth that can set them free from all of these things. Father, may we look beyond the fact of being unable, because we are. May we look to the fact of you being the sovereign God who is able to do all things through your men and women, through your children. May our life be godly before them as you give us grace to do it. And may our words be sensitive and clear. May our prayers be frequent and often. May we approach your throne of grace desiring to see open doors and to be effective in witnessing. We thank you for those to whom you've equipped to send to the continent of Africa and Central and South America and Asia and Europe and even here in our own land to, to do special works. But Lord, that doesn't excuse us here in Jerusalem from being the witnesses that you've called us to be. Thank you, Father, for your word as it would challenge our hearts to live for you. And we pray it in Jesus' name, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Coleman. A wonderful challenge, and I hope you pick it up. You know, it occurred to me in the first part of your sermon, I slept through the rest of it, not really, uh, but the first part of your sermon, he was talking about how the church at its weakest point took up the gauntlet and spread the word. Can you think of a weaker point that our church has ever been at? Folks, God uses the weak things of the world. God uses the things that are nothing. God uses the off-scourings and the refuse. Now is not a time to be discouraged. Now is a time to be encouraged that God can use us to reach those who do not know Jesus Christ with the amazing gospel of salvation. Our closing hymn is much along that same line, number 440, So Send I You. Let's all stand and sing all four verses. 440, So Send I You by Grace Made Strong to Triumph. Let's stand and sing. <laughs>